Hello, thank you for your time and attention today. This is about the Solid Carbon Project, a climate mitigation partnership advancing stable negative emissions, where we are currently undertaking a feasibility study on how to efficiently carry out offshore direct air capture of CO2 and storing it safely in ocean basalt rock where it turns into carbonate. I'm speaking on behalf of my co-authors and a large team from a consortium of research institutions. This large project involves experts in geophysics and remote sensing from Ocean Networks Canada, negative emissions from the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, which is also the prime funder of our feasibility study, basalt geochemistry from the Universities of Victoria and of British Columbia, as well as the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University, USA. Cascadia Hydrology, Hydrogeology from the University of California in Santa Cruz, USA. Ultramafic Carbon Storage and Hydrogeology from the University of Calgary. Social Acceptance also from UBC. And CCS Law from Columbia Law. A previous pre-feasibility study on this topic called Carbon Safe was led by Columbia University and involved several of the current project partners already. Various other aspects of this project have been studied independently before. Here we bring together quite a large team and we also hope to expand our group with our other interested partners. The big idea is to take CO2 from the atmosphere and bypass the natural processes that capture CO2. Natural processes cannot keep up with current CO2 emissions and we plan to have direct CO2 sequestration in ocean basalt where the natural process of serpentinization is accelerated by new CO2 availability by injection. This is a busy diagram and you do not need to read it all, but the key concept is a large floating platform or platforms with most likely wind, but potentially also solar power generation, supporting direct air capture and then dropping CO2 down below the ocean floor. There is no energy input into the system once the floating platform is commissioned as locally generated energy drives the process at the surface as well as powering the monitoring system. And conventional offshore risers and wells can be used for injection. So where should this project start? The Juan de Fuca plate is a good starting location. The first regional deep sea observatory already operated by Ocean Networks Canada off the coast of British Columbia with proximity to American waters for joint research. Under that observatory is an impenetrable cap rock of thicker than usual Pleistocene sediments shed from BC during the glacial low stand sea levels. The basalt geology is well understood due to extensive seismic and well coverage from the ocean drilling ODP and IODP programs going back decades. The observatory has a monitoring location already in place in one set of those wells and wired to the internet by an 800 kilometer long cable. But the key is that the thick pillow basalt layers with multi-Darcy level permeability have storage capacity enough for decades of current global emissions. The amount of basalt in the world is not a limiting factor, but there is a challenge of injecting CO2 on an, under an average water depth of three kilometers. Once the technology is determined, upscaling would easily make this a permanent global climate solution. Older ocean floor basalts already have much carbonate precipitation that has taken CO2 out of older ocean water on the scale of millennia that is required for deep ocean circulation. Solid carbon plans to take that time frame down to a human time scale. So, what is happening already? There are many projects around the world that are studying this, including here in Western Canada. There is some history, as I remember, a scoping study in the mid 1990s that was figuring out infrastructure to take Alberta flue gas to serpentinization locations in, in British Columbia. There are mining studies today at UBC looking at how much atmospheric slow CO2 slowly gets taken up by rubble from mining that is exposed to the atmosphere. This is similar to surficial studies in Oman where and other ophiolite areas of the Middle East where surficial carbonate scale on the rocks is forming 
today from atmospheric exposure. Just to the south of us, in Oregon and Washington, a drill program was completed to inject CO2 into the Columbia River basalts, but the star in the project has been carb fix in Iceland with results of carbonation of most of the injection, injected CO2 already after only a few years after injection. They are also getting increased formation permeability during combined H2S and CO2 injection in aqueous solution. Overall, they are providing us, a, providing us with a very positive outlook of the potential of locking away large amounts of CO2 and basalt rock in the safest way possible as solid precipitate. The overall layout of our current feasibility study is divided into three main activity areas. Activity one is the technical pathway to bring together existing technologies to enable large scale CO2 direct air capture offshore on floating platforms using sustainable in situ generated energy. Activity two is focused on what is happening at depth from modeling the fate of the CO2 and basalt, how it turns into carbonate rock, to the required monitoring to ensure this process is working as planned. And as a direct result, create a demonstration, demonstration plan to carry out real CO2 injection experiments. And finally, activity three is looking into the more human aspect of this idea, how it would be perceived by the general public, and also, also quite importantly, to address the regulatory and legal aspects of dumping CO2 in Canadian or international waters. And finally, potential project partners like industry or other investors to transform this idea into an established global climate solution. There's a lot that we can learn from the technology used by the oil and gas industry when it comes to pumping carbon, in our case, into the reservoirs rather than out. In the following slides, I will show more detail and focus especially on activity two, the basalt storage and monitoring aspects. A key component is the surface infrastructure of a floating platform to drive the whole process. There will be no tankers burning bunker fuel to load from onshore emitters and transport C compressed CO2 out to a drilling riser. The whole capture sequence will be self-contained and out of sight of everyone except the space station and fishermen. There is not much geology to be done in this engineering phase, but there's a lot of ocean chemistry that is related to how the CO2 would interact with the environment between the platform and the ocean floor. The biggest challenges of this activity one are the marinization of, and upscaling of the air capture, the most effective generation of energy, and the floating platform. All of these components already exist, but combining them has not been done before. Activity two is putting together all the components to eventually carry out an injection test, a demonstration of offshore CO2 storage in basalt rock. This relies on previous hydrogeological experiments that provided good background information on natural fluid flow through this part of the ocean floor. Permeability has been published and the volumes of natural hydrogeologic flow through the basalt is reasonably well known. Conveniently, these drill holes can be used again for testing the injection of CO2 as the instrumentation is already installed. The full scale up the project will involve deep ocean drilling for more drill holes to achieve large areas of injection and to core the basalt to confirm mineralization. Modeling is underway to show the deposition of carbonates during the serpentinization reactions. Reactive transport modeling combines both computer simulations and lab experiments. Some of this has been completed under the previously mentioned CarbSafe project with results published by Columbia University, but new work is being intensified at the University of Calgary. The natural flow regime can be coupled with fluid mixing to maintain permeability while still having active mineralization. Injection and well operations will be in collaboration with industry. Active and passive monitoring, as well as sampling design, is necessary to detect any environmental changes and prove CO2 capture. Geophysics is key here, and the data collected will ideally be accessible in real time via data transmission cable from remote sites under 2,600 meters of ocean water, but it is then accessible to everyone on the internet. 
geochemistry is different from other geological CO2 storage concepts in sedimentary layers because of the water depth. There is a reverse thermal gradient. It gets colder with depth. And CO2 is compressible to a dense liquid, but water is not. The conditions are also within the clathrate formation for CO2, and the water is undersaturated for CO2. Any CO2 released can flash to aqueous solution so quickly, but clathrate formation as a gas hydrate can seal off those release points. The kinetics of those reactions are still being studied, and we plan to monitor a controlled leakage. Some of the new research at UBC and Columbia is on the legal and social background for projects of this nature. In some cases, the regulatory framework is not completely filled in and much of the public have no concept or opinion on the deep ocean environment or offshore operation. In summary, this is a large integrated project with many disciplines involved. Key geology and geophysics expertise is needed in the modeling, geochemistry, and monitoring tasks. We will be looking for interested students and collaborators to complete subprojects over the next few years. Feel free to check out our project website, solidcarbon.ca. I will be open for questions after a short delay to switch computer format.